to limit how screwed we are when we do get owned. So, uh, page down. My name is Carol Fenley. I've been in IT for over 25 years, mostly as a freelance consultant. I've written a lot of caustic articles at various times on information security. And as we were discussing earlier, co-found this hacker court organization that does these mock trials at Black Hat mostly. And presently, I'm a security information specialist with Tenable Network Security, who bring you the Nessus scanner, among other things. So. Incident response, you've heard about a lot about it in the conference and how important it is to have a plan and have a policy. And I was involved in incident response from the early 80s when I was in Bell Labs. So uh, it's evolved from a technical issue with technical people to a business issue. And a lot of times through the conference, you've heard a lot of things about business initiatives and the technical side of it. So I'm trying to show you here how an incident response policy has really got to include both sides of that. Task goals back in the 80s when I was involved with this. You really, the purpose of incident response was catch the wily hacker, or harden your systems, resume operations, and monitor for attacks. There wasn't a lot of business reasons for it because the business wasn't involved. This is the pre commercial internet days. So it was really a technical issue handled by technical people. Early guidance that we had on this we had uh, when I was in Bell Labs, Shadowhawk was hacking into our systems and after about 80 times and causing a lot of damage, we really did have to do something about him. So we formed various response teams that would go out to sites and try to set, find out what worked, what didn't work. We got to one site and passwords and you know we'll do all this at noon. She sends a mess broadcast message out to all users on the system saying systems are coming down at noon and changing the data key passwords. <laughs> and then so again they were still from back because the already wants to restore operations right away and it keeps getting hit again and again and again for several weeks to the point that everything had to be completely reloaded. So we're going to go to the RFC, those of you familiar with RFCs, request for comments, providing some guidance on incident response. And all of these are still talking about it from a technical point of view, that this is something that systems administrators have to do all these things. Systems administrators make the decisions. Personal involvement, technical staff, technical management, because they've got to manage your staff hours, maybe law enforcement, and really what the law enforcement do. Not a lot, they weren't trained in it. There weren't a lot of laws you could do at the time, but they're trying. Current goals. Now we're in the business community, in the commercial days of the internet. You want to protect assets, demonstrate compliance, save money. Catch the intruder, and how important is that? If the intruder's in Russia or China or someplace else, why are you going to put all those efforts into trying to catch somebody that you can't do anything about anyway? <coughs> There's a case that uh, John and I worked on, we were on the front side of this. Bloomberg LLC was um, claimed to be extorted money from a Russian hacker who broke into their systems. And they did a really nice thing operation, got the emails with no headers, incidentally. Um, got the guy to show up, prosecuted the case. This is a big showcase for the FBI to show cooperation between the Kazakhstan office and the, Ka the Kazakhstani government and the U.S. government. But from a business point of view, Bloomberg put a lot of staff hours into this. They had to do a lot of research, produce a lot of evidence, testify in court, and I don't really see how this benefited their bottom line. It may have benefited their reputation, but not necessarily the bottom line. Well, they, they claimed and were awarded $980,000 worth of damages, but even the judge said, once the guy yeah. finishes the sentence, he's being deported. Go try to collect. Yeah, they awarded nine hundred eighty thousand dollars in damages from a guy in Kazakhstan who mm, tried to get the money. So, catching the intruder important sometimes, but not as important as basically covering your ass. And here's the cover your ass part of it: compliance. And a lot of you are familiar with many of these compliance issues, and it's debatable <coughs> how well these are done. 
but some of them do require you, for example, the PCI compliance says that you must have a written incident response plan. And I've had clients ask me, come in, write me an incident response plan, and I look at their infrastructure and say, I can write the plan, but you have nothing in place to support it. So what good is your plan going to be? So, okay, we want to remove that from that. So that brings into um, Mike. Mike Rockman did a really good talk on how compliance can get you killed. So, but it's there and you need it. A few people are laughing about data loss in this conference. And attrition.org does a really great job in getting all the public information about data loss, putting it into a database so that you can search it. And this site, oh, I just should mention up front. I've got research questions at the back, so don't worry about writing down links or anything. This site is great because you can search it and give it various criteria and look up all the data loss statistics. So if you want to show your management companies that have had things, you've got the 94 million records lost from TJ Maxx and various other information here. You can bring up different graphs, and this is a great tool. I was looking at this originally, and I was going to try to come up with some nice, scary numbers. Another organization called Ponemon came up with this figure of each data loss record is worth $197, million, uh, $197 per record, sorry. $197 per record. But that, if you look at the TJ Maxx one, the math doesn't add up. That's $1.8 billion. So I think there's something wrong with their statistics. They only surveyed 35 companies. Does that take into account aggregation of credit information? So it's hard to really get numbers associated with this but it's still significant to show that there are things involved with it. But from a business point of view, you want to protect your investment, limit your re revenue loss, comply with the protect your stock value, protect your liability, and retain consumer confidence. Having this up on a public site doesn't exactly inspire consumer confidence. NIST and NIST have various guides out there, and I've got a resource for the NIST guide that just came out. It's 147 pages in search of an editor. But it really boils down to these main areas. So if you're going to write yourself an incident response plan, these are going to be your headers. These are the sections that you're dealing with. But you have to be, this has to be a partnership with the business units and the technology units. You need the people, process, and technologies in place to support all of this. Preparation. Most of the incident response plan is going to be in the preparation area. You're going to see that most of my slides are going to be talking about preparation. Reason being, you don't have time during an incident to sit there and download a NESA scanner to find out what vulnerabilities you have and figure out how to use it meanwhile. You don't have time to do all these things. So you have to have a lot of these places, these pieces in place before you start. For informing your CSOP, Develop policies and procedures, assess technology needs, business analysis, and develop your security awareness program, and test the plan, which is really important. CISO It used to be only one of those technology people involved in incident response is a technical issue. The really important person to have involved here is the executive sponsor. You need somebody from the CEO office level who is going to mandate that this is what we're doing and we're blessing this and we're telling you you have to do this. Give the technology people some power to actually do things. Give the business people a reason for why they have to spend some time doing some work and they have work to do. You need to involve the IT director. You need a CSA coordinator. This is going to be the person that's going to run points on your incident response, coordinate all the response, gather the information, and we'll run things later. You'll need technical subject matter experts, legal representation, and HR. <coughs> HR has to be involved for incidents that involve internal people. Legal to find out where those people are legally. And business unit representatives. This is really important. I'll talk a little bit later about the fact that you need data classification. Business units are the ones that know what's at risk. If you're a tech person, you don't really know or care what's on the systems half the time. You just know that we need to have this database server, we need this FTP server. These are the technical needs that we have to support, the amount of disk space that we need. But the people who are important for the data are the business units. 
and they have to be involved in this and meet with these people to say, yeah, here's our information and no, none of this can go in public areas or this needs to be in a protected server and this is what's important to us. Law enforcement. If you go to any of the law enforcement talks and incident response, first thing they're going to tell you is call the cops. And sometimes you do have to. If it's a case that's involved in a crime, such as child pornography on your systems, anything like that that you could be held liable, you absolutely have to involve the cops. But you don't necessarily have to. And it could be good on the incident and what depends on your business needs. If you're a Chinese bank based in Manhattan, does your management want the FBI in doing an investigation on your systems? Maybe not. Um, good point about that depends on your local law enforcement office. Some of them are really well trained. They have all the tools. They've got NKs. They've got various things to gather all the information about the hack. They hopefully have a lot of good information they can give you and can help run the thing. And we'll probably end up be mostly representing you in court. You'll have certain internal people involved, but it won't be too many people. It doesn't have to be invasive to grab law enforcement. There's a lot of concern about, uh, there was a big story years ago about Steve Jackson games that the Secret Service got involved and wiped them out of business, which wasn't entirely true, but it was a pretty painful process for them. They don't do that anymore because nobody's going to call them if they have a reputation for doing that. So depending on the officer you're involved with, they can be pretty decent guys. But I have to be about it. If you've got a good technology infrastructure in place, you've got secure information management systems, you've got the IDS, and this is all part of your preparation, you could just hand them logs and say, here's all my stuff, give them CDs, they go on their way, they, they're the evidence custodians, and they can take care of it for you. But also, uh, consider if you bring the law enforcement, are you prepared to go to court? Yeah. One of the things that I've always suggested is get to know your local law enforcement. Call up the local FBI office if you're the CISO and introduce yourself. So that way, if there is, if you do have an incident, you know who to call. It's not <coughs> scrambling on a website looking for an 800 number. That's a very good point. And another good point about that is if you go to, um, what, I forgot the name of the organizations, New York had one. Oh. Uh, there's various cities of electronic task force. If you go to some of the meetings, you'll get a feeling for how competent the law enforcement groups are. And that's a good way to judge of, do I really want these people coming into my system if I have a problem? So you also have to consider, are you prepared to go to court? Well, if it's a criminal case, dealing with child porn or something like that, you have to. Um, if it is an intrusion in your systems, You've got to look at, in, as in Bloomberg's case, the likelihood of collecting on anything versus how much of my people's time is going to be involved with this. The court may, case may happen three years after the intrusion. Am I still going to have the people in place? Am I going to remember this? Do I really want, Bloomberg was mayor at the time that he got subpoenaed to show up in court to talk about this hack. Probably wasn't the, his hot, top priority thing of wanting to do. He was a little bit pissed off, wasn't he? And it also made the news because yeah. wasn't there. Yeah. So, things to consider. This could be several talks on its own, so I'm just skimming over it. Before you have an incident response plan, you need to have some policies and procedures in place. Because how do you know what's violating a uh, security policy, and how do you know what your controls are in place if you don't have a policy about it? The executive statement, that's supposed to come from management saying, we're going to beat you with a stick if you don't listen to this. You're fired if you do these things and what the penalties are and basically enforcing it. Asset protection and information management, that's also, um, I used to call it that, every, the buzzword these days is data leak protection. This is really important when you want to get into classifying data, and that was a point I made in uh, another talk where the business units need to sit down and say, this is the kind of data we have. We've got data that is public information, brochure stuff that we go on and put on our website. We don't care if that goes public. We've got stuff that's internal things, but it's just proprietary internal. Then we've got proprietary need to know. And then we've got you know, completely classified. And you have other classifications, such as patient health care information, credit card information. 
they need to identify what all this is so that they can sit down with the IT people and say, okay, when you're doing your architecture, any data that's labeled this way needs to be protected because you shouldn't be protecting your publicly available information with the same mechanisms as personal information about your users or financial information. It's a different amount of controls. So that's important to help the systems administrators and network administrators understand how they can design their network. And part of my rant and what really pisses me off is that people blame a lot of these hacks on, oh, well, systems administration didn't keep up with patches. Well, you didn't tell me that you were putting social security numbers on this FTP server in the DMZ zone. I thought you were just <laughs> putting <laughs> brochures out there, you, you know. You can also view as you can tie it into your service level agreements between the business units and the IT department as just it's another level of services that you're providing to protect this, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to access this data. Yep. Uh, acceptable use policy, most of you know this is what deals with your users. It should also have a section on acceptable use for people with third party access. And basically you write contracts, you have to tell them what they're responsible for, um, not naming names, but a colleague of mine just did an audit of a place that had outsourced this FTP server and he looked at the FTP server and said, there's social security numbers on this thing and it's got vulnerabilities. So just because you've outsourced it to a third party doesn't mean you're off the hook. You still are the owner of that data. So you've got to make sure those agreements are in place so that you can then sue them later when you have a nice little data loss. Um, auditing, monitoring, and compliance, you have to have that in place. Seems like kind of a duh thing, but you have to tell people you're auditing, monitoring systems. You also need to have a disaster recovery plan. Some incidents can be so catastrophic that it's impacted the business so much that you need to result to a disaster recovery plan. Now, disaster recovery plan is different from incident response in that that's dealing many times with uh, physical loss, like the 9-11 was disaster recovery plans. So you need to ha cover incidents that might have a big catastrophic effect on your business. Um, other thing you need is contact lists internal organizations, vendors, third-party connections, law enforcement agencies. This is another thing that might seem kind of obvious, but are you really scrambling around during an incident trying to say, uh, who's the business owner for this? Where's this person? This needs to be a unified place, and it needs to be as part of the plan, and it needs to get updated regularly. Vendors are important because they'll have the latest information about patches, about vulnerabilities, you could call up and say, I've seen this, what's the implications of this? And you need to get hold of them quickly. Part of uh, preparation, and this is still preparation, you need to do a technology assessment. And before you do an incident response plan, you probably want to have a third party come in and do a technology assessment or just a whole risk assessment on your organization. And part of that's going to be a technology assessment because you need to have everything in place to respond to the incident. Part of the incident is you need to be able to detect it, and that's where your monitoring tools come in place. You need to be able to contain it. Network segregation. Do you have uh, NAC devices or firewalls where you can say, I'm getting this intrusion, I want to track it a little bit, but I don't want it to spread to the rest of the organization. I need to set up filtering rules to cut this thing off and isolate it and keep it from spreading further in my organization. And this comes down to money, because if you look at those data losses, if you let this thing spread, the more data loss you're going to have and the more attrition is going to have your numbers up there. Uh, investigative tools, you need that both for gathering evidence and to investigate the incidents. Gathering evidence, um, window systems, You'll want to have the ability to mirror the disks, which would usually be using a tool like Encase. If you called in law enforcement, they already have it. They know how to use it, so that's easier for you. If you're a Unix kind of shop, you'll want to run something like DD, pipe it to Netcat, and get a byte-for-byte -byte mirror copy of the systems. You need to have operating um, system hardening tools. You need antivirus spyware because that's going to help you in eradicating the problem. 
and same with patch management and you need good backups to recover from the incident and these backups will need to be verified and looked at because sometimes you have an intrusion in there they could have been in there for months so your backups could be tainted but this is the part that's often missing from incident response you're going to need to have a business risk analysis about the incident you have to identify business information owners identify what your critical applications are classify your data what do I have that's patient health? What's credit card data? What's financial data? You need this for all those compliance things we saw earlier. So you need to know what's been hit because this is going to affect who you've got to notify, who you've got to get involved, and really important po point here. Final part of preparation, but by no means the least, is security awareness program. You need to have user training. Users are your early warning system. They notice weird things, they call the help desk, they might see something funny, um, you know, what is this thing that's popping up on my system? So they need to be trained to, to be able to detect and report incidents, they need to know who to call if there is an incident. For your technical staff, and this is preaching to the choir here, because you wouldn't be at a security conference if you didn't know this, be on security mailing lists, take security training, monitor vulnerability databases, patch databases, and attend security conferences like SOURCE. So next step was detection. We've gone from preparation to detection, and it's what, how many slides? Um, 19. Detection is often um, very obvious. You can have all, the, all hells breaking loose, and you know it's going to be a bad day. <laughs> A lot of the detection part of it is fairly obvious. You know, you've got your red phone green at 3 in the morning, and somebody's going to be there and jump on the systems, and all these things are br breaking loose, and everybody's running into action. I think that's about as believable as women going into labor and all of a sudden having the baby in five minutes, which any of you who had kids, it doesn't really work that way. You get some obvious indicators of an attack. Um, these kind of obvious indicators are for amateurs. They're from script idiots. Because th a lot of times, and anybody who's been involved with attrition knows this, they want fame. They want to, everybody to know who they are. They want to know that they're the leadest hackers. So you could get an obvious indicator, communication from attacker, which is what happened in the Bloomberg case. He sent mail to Michael Bloomberg saying, hello, I've hacked into your system. Do you want to hire me to fix it? Which is another kiddiot stupidity. But he wasn't a kiddiot, but it was pretty really mm -hmm. stupid. You could get communication from law enforcement who's dealing with another breach, and they are contacting you because they know that you were the next site, or maybe you were the site of origin. Communication from another site, the same thing. Um, another part that's important to include that is you get communication from another site, make sure it's not a social engineering thing. You're a systems administrator. Your first thing is not to send him your logs. Your first thing is to go talk to your manager and get in your CSERT team involved and let them decide how you're dealing with this. System administrators shouldn't be doing this on their own. Obvious indicator, network floods. Um, your IDS goes off. That's usually pretty obvious. Damage, missing data, uh, unusual system behavior. I don't think that's always so obvious, but we disagree. And sometimes it's very obvious. Your website's hacked. Fluffy Bunny owns you. This was actually a website defacement of SANS. <laughs> Wasn't a good day for SANS. The real criminal is going to be a lot more subtle. Any kind of good criminal isn't going to, well, won't want to be detected, especially if you're talking about business risks and the dates of corporate espionage and any of you who went to Jim Atkinson's really, really scary talk uh, know that you know, anybody who's any good wants to hide their tracks and be very, very careful about what they're s doing. In fact, some of them, uh, no, he's not in this room, will even patch systems to make them work better so the systems administrator doesn't get hacked by some idiot while he's going through getting the systems. Um, so, and there are people who have done that. So you're looking for resource drains, unexplained services running on the systems, program changes, um, Unexplained reboots, log files inconsistent, file permission changes, help desk complaints, anything that's pretty much unusual. Um, one of the most famous cases of uh, an incident response was Cliff Stoll back in, I forget the year, 
um, 75 cent accounting error. His cuckoo's egg was based on this. He wasn't tracking down a hacker or intruder. He was just wondering, why do I have a 75 cent accounting error? And it got traced to a hacking group out in Germany. It turned out to be something. So to really be aware of the subtle indications on your systems, you have to first know your systems. You have to have them mapped out and have baseline in place of monitoring tools for your system to know what's normal and what's not normal. Follow up on what's not normal. It may be nothing, but it might be something. So now you've got a, you'd have an incident. You've identified that you have an incident. Um, you need to evaluate the technical impact. Now this is what every, all your tech guys are going to be focused on. This is probably not a comprehensive list, but this is just an example of some things I've dealt with. Penetration attempt, you want to know, is it in progress? What's the source of the attack? What systems are involved? Are there applications involved? And you can come up with this and come up with your own metrics to rate this and say, you know, scale of one to five. I didn't bother giving you one here because I've seen sites all do it differently. So come up with what's important to you and come up with a rating for each of these. And then you can add up those ratings and have a number for this is the metric we're giving for the technical impact of this attack. As part of the technical impact, they have to identify who from the business ne units need to get involved because they're looking at what applications are involved, if it's a data loss policy violation, because that's going to be HR, criminal activity, they'll know, okay, we now have to, have to inform legal. And I've seen places with lots of questionnaire forms, which I wasn't going to bore you with here. But these are the basic things. So now they've decided, here's the business people that act to get involved. And the business part of the CCERT team has to look at this and determine, is this high impact, medium impact, low impact? And again, come up with their metrics for a rating on this so that we can determine how important is this. So an FTP attack um, or an FTP server goes out. Well, it's only had you know some brochure stuff and things nobody cares about, and it was just public information. So it might be, from a technical point of view, an important hack. But from a business point of view, we don't really care. Or it could be. Technically, eh, one little PC had a virus on it and had a keystroke logger on it, but it's just one PC in the organization. But the business guys could look at it and say, yeah, but that PC had all the client data and credit card databases for 90 million users, and uh, yeah, it's kind of important. So it's all evaluation, and you can't have one side do it alone. They have to do it together. So basic intrusion re response sex. I'm doing good on time. Okay. First thing is you've got to document everything, and that means everything. Just keep a little notebook, and I advise you to make it a fresh notebook. Um, John and I have debated this, but it could be that your notebook could get subpoenaed, so you don't want it to have all of your little scribbles and notes and personal jokes that you're writing in board meetings in it. So you might want to grab a fresh notebook to make sure that, you know, yeah, this is what I can give you and look at. It's important when you do your documentation to write down full names of people involved. If you just write initials, three years later, if you're using that to refresh your memory in court, do you remember who ND was? Um, you need to know who that was. You need to be able to notify the appropriate contacts, protect your systems, and limit data loss, gather volatile information. Now, I referred to before um, that person who rebooted the systems before we came on site. We couldn't really do anything because we couldn't, all the information about that attack was gone. We didn't have the IP addresses. We didn't have the processes involved. We couldn't find where the back door was because it was now not running. So, and this is also one of those trade-offs in your business response of, do you have time to gather volatile information? If you are at risk for losing all that data, if there's a huge amount of data on that system, you might just decide, disconnect the system. You know, we don't care. We just don't want to have that data loss. And this is part of why you have to make this a business decision. After you vol gather volatile data, mirror the disks. And mentioned mirroring is a byte for byte copy. You've got to get all the information from the disks. This is important because you don't want to do an investigation on a live system. And I know a lot of systems administrators do this. They get an attack. They just, just jump right into the systems and start looking around, running commands. As you're running those commands, you're modifying some of the metadata of files that really gives you the footprint 
of what has happened. Um, I know in Unix systems you've got inode information like creation time, modification time, and access time. And that's important information to have, and that can give you an idea of what files the attacker was looking at. But if you've trampled all over the system by trying to do an investigation prematurely, that data is not available. So before rushing in and doing analysis, get that information off. It doesn't take a long time. Create that evidence. Actually, what you want to do after you mirror the disk is make a copy of that mirror. And I should have put that step here. Safeguard the evidence. Evidence custodian. Many times, if you're dealing with law enforcement, you'll pass it off to them. If you're dealing with your own people, find a locked room. Don't leave it out on an open desk. Um, and make sure you've got a change log involved with that. Containment. Containment is a big part, especially to prevent data loss. You need to, and these are some of the technical things you might think of. You can add more. Disable new login sessions. Unmount disk drives. These are different things that you can do to contain the incident. Uh, check for dead man switches. Before you reboot the system, there are cert some people will put in what's called a dead man switch that if they see the indication of a reboot or shutdown or anything that's going after them, they have a program in place that's going to wipe out the system, wipe out the data, and you've lost everything. So you need to look for that. Shut down the affected systems if the data is at risk after checking for dead man switches. You could disconnect the network interface. Again, these are business decisions based on what is at risk and how much you want to gather. Um, if any of you are familiar with the uh, book Firewalls and Internet Security by Cheswick and Belvin. He's got a great chapter in there on catching the wily hacker. And Bill Cheswick had the luxury of doing that because he didn't really have a lot of data at risk. He set up a nice little honey pot. So he had the ability to play with the intruder and gather information. And that's really fun to do from a security perspective. But if you're in the business world and you're doing that is possibly putting client information at risk, it's your job. You know. So um, you can disconnect the network interface, modify firewall and router, fire, uh, router filtering rules. You might not have to shut down your entire network, but you certainly want to segregate it off so that the intrusion can't go further. Disable compromised services. Um, you can move the devices to a containment VLAN so you can keep everything up, but it's in this nice little sandbox where it's not going to affect the rest of your network. And these are all technical things that you can do, but these are technical things based on business input, and that business input's important. You can also modify DNS <coughs> records, point to a different IP address, so you've got your backup site that hopefully you've you know, checked, found maybe the vulnerabilities, and fixed them while you're looking at everything else. I talked about this before. Collecting volatile data, processes, memory, network connections, open file descriptors. This stuff goes away once you reboot. So you want to try to get all this information uh, while it's still fresh and while it's there. When you're mirroring disks, um, you can actually have a write block on the source disk to make sure you don't accidentally write on the source disk. And that's pretty important to do, too. You want to make sure that people can't turn around and say this disk was compromised. One important note to make, uh, I know a lot of technical people, we do hacker court at Black Hat, who say, in one of our cases, we had a laptop rebooted. And he said, oh, well, that wouldn't be admissible. Admissible evidence in court <coughs> is whatever the judge decides can get admitted. And in the Bloomberg case, uh, John showed that in Kazakhstan, the FBI guys rebooted the, the system. The FBI, but the, the, oh, the Kazakhstan version of the FBI rebooted systems, modified files that were evidence files, and it was admitted anyway. There was no. Uh, log file, there was no um, email headers. So all the things that us in the ivory tower say, oh no, if you don't have this, it's not going to be admissible. Doesn't matter. It depends on what the judge thinks. And most of the time, <coughs> the judge doesn't know technology. <coughs> and I, I can't speak for state courts, but I know in the federal rules of evidence, you have to show that the evidence is just so worthless as to have it thrown out. As long as you have, as long as you have a process that in place before an incident and you follow that process, you're going to get that evidence admitted, even if it's not perfect. Sure. It is going to go in. It'll be weighted less, but it's going in. Okay. Where am I? 
evidence protection. This is also important because you get to a court case and uh, Jesse Kornblum, who's a really good friend of mine, was a captain of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations at one point, and he said, most of the cases, this is where it's going to bite you. If that evidence can be shown, it doesn't matter how well you've gathered it, it could be shown that it could have been compromised anywhere along the way, you can challenge it. It's, again, up to the judge and it's up to the jury to decide what they believe. In the Bloomberg case, even though we showed all of this, the fact of the matter is there's the practical aspect of it, too. The defendant showed up at the meet to kind of confirm the email he sent, so that sort of screwed him right there. So, need to make sure it's locked in a safe place, signed in and, each and out each time, and the chain of custody has to stay with the evidence. If you've involved law enforcement, they're doing this, but until you've involved law enforcement, you know, take that disc, wrap it in a static bag, um, put it in a locked desk that you know who has access to it, and you've at least shown a due diligence in protecting the evidence. Just don't leave it out in a cube form on your desk overnight, because then somebody can say things. Yes, Jim? A good rule of thumb is always make three copies. Yes. The original, the one for the law enforcement, the one you give to corporate counsel, to lock up when the FBI loses theirs. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I'd also say a fourth one, and the fourth one will be the one that you're going to use. Actually, I'd go five. I'd do a fourth one that's going to be your on-site master, and a fifth one that you're going to do your analysis on, but you can go back to the on-site master if you're not sure if you've screwed up your, you know, one that you're doing the analysis on. And get copies out of your into a third party's control, like law enforcement or corporate counsel, mm -hmm. and always keep copies of it off-site yes. so that if, God forbid, somebody steals the three copies that you have, you have another copy. Another point which I should have put in here, but it just occurred to me, two MD5 checksums on each one of your copies. This way, you've got those checksums, and you can say this checksum matches this one, this matches this one, and they all agree. So that's showing more solid protection of your evidence. And I really should have put that in, sorry. That was in my son course. You make a good point about the one that the federal agency loses. I worked on one case where the Customs Department had it in their office, and when the World Trade Centers came down, their office happened to be at Five World Trade, yeah. we lost the evidence, and our case, the case got dismissed. If I get through these really quickly, we've got loads of law war stories, so if we don't do it here, we'll do it on the pub crawl or something. Um, yeah, we were just talking about this. Forensic analysis. Use a disk mirror for a forensic exam. Of course, do not use your original disk. Use a copy of it, and actually use a copy of a copy so that you've got something to go back to to say, I don't know if somebody overwrites something on here or what we did. Let's just compare it to the original one. Never use your source disk. I can't emphasize that enough show that you've got a set methodology for your forensics exam. Uh, who's done what? We're doing this now. Keep notes, document things as you go along that we did this step, this step, this step. Keep in mind, you might be called to court later and you'll need to say, this is what I did, so remember what you did because if you're on uh, cross-examination, they are brutal. They are very brutal. Document any test program you create. Uh, if you're not using something that's a public source or forensics tool that's established, you've written your own stuff, you're a super elite guy and um, you can write your own test programs, you've got a theory about what happened. If you get to court and you're saying you use this program, you've now crossed the line from factual witness to expert witness. And the important part about that is factual witness, we don't care how dumb you are, you just are testifying as to facts. We do care how drunk you were, but we're caring about your facts. If you go over to expert witness, I can start challenging you on, well, what did you mean soft eyes? Didn't you mean black eyes? Don't you know what programs you're using? Which John did to some poor guy. Um, and you can start hitting them on that. And if they can't answer all these questions, they look really stupid. And it's like, well, you know, what kind of test did he do? He doesn't even know the technology he's using. So you have to be careful about that. Be, and what I say about being prepared to be on court, it is not a very comfortable environment. Being on the cross-examination is why I don't testify in court. I actually do research for the lawyers. I find them things and say, no, I don't want to be on the stand. We'll let John do that. So, and he has. And he did a very good job, too. Restoring operations. The order of this is really controversial about restoring operations. 
There are places that want to restore operations quickly. You're going to see that as the business driver, that poor site in Bell Labs that I dealt with. I actually felt sorry for the system administrator because she had the users from hell who wanted the systems back, didn't really know what happened, and they kept getting hammered over and over and over again. There's a case, and I don't have all the details here, TerraGrid got hit and they restored operations and they kept getting hit again and again for weeks because they didn't fully understand the extent of the intrusion and as Jim pointed out you've got the guys who are giving you the obvious one the red herring here is uh, how oh obviously the person got in this way and then there's all of the subtle things and not to mention the back doors that could be all over the system so once they're in, you've got to figure they got everything. And you've got to look at every system you have with tr trust um, relationships. Um, part of restoring is you need to isolate your target system from the rest of the network. Uh, need to ensure the integrity installation media. Is it a backup tape? Uh, you know, maybe you want the original. Make sure you got the MD5 checksums from the um, vendor. Ensure the integrity of your backups. If the intruder was any good, there are still holes in all your backup systems, so you need to review those things first. Um, part of restoring operations, I could go on a long thing about how you can harden systems and various tools you can use to lock down your systems, but Center for Internet Security has done some really great benchmarks on this, and these benchmarks are a consensus of people in the industry. I wrote one on Solaris 10, so um, I'm familiar with the process, and that's one of the resources I have at the end. Gra go out, find one of their benchmarks, and use this as a guideline when you're restoring your systems of best practices to try to secure your system. They do suggest additional security software that you might want to consider. Um, you could also consider, and I'm not saying this because I'm with a vendor, but there are vendor packages you could look at independently. You may want to have a third party come in and look at it, make some recommendations, take it with a grain of salt, and look at a few different people. What works in one organization may not work in another. Um, changing all passwords and keys. Most people get the passwords part of it, but if you've got a certificate authority on the network, figure that's compromised. Figure almost anything on the network is compromised, so you're going to have to reissue all certificates and SSH keys and all that sort of stuff. So you're going back online. Uh, monitor for repeat attacks is one of these sort of uh, dull slides, but um, <laughs> pretty important. <coughs> the attack vector may be the same attacker. It might be a copycat. Uh, when I did the Sun course, uh, Jericho from Attrition worked with me on that, and he said he used to have what he called mirror monitors, people who monitored Attrition's web defacement mirror, saw an attack, and then all the copycats would want to jump on board and go after the same site. Or there could be news articles about it, and there's nothing some hackers like better. And I don't use hackers in a bad way, just whatever. Um, nothing they like better is to prove that you don't know anything about security and you screwed it up and you came online too quickly, so they will attack you. Um, consider installing additional monitoring tools. If you've been hit and hit really bad, chances are the monitoring tools you had in place weren't effective. One thing I failed to mention earlier is as part of your third party um, contracts. It's important to have an agreement in place in where you can place sniffers because you can have a sniffer on your network but you're not allowed to sniff outside of your network or on the public area or a third party. If you've got an agreement in place with the third parties, you can agree ahead of time that if we have an intrusion we will just set up this sniffer before having to get management involved and do all of this stuff so we can try to track down the source of the attack. Um, other important aspect, allocate additional staff hours because you're going to need to monitor pretty carefully, see what's going on before you can hopefully feel that you fixed it. The postmortem, this is where you're going to get your lessons learned. Uh, the CSER team will obviously need to meet, create a postmortem report. They might do additional forensic analysis here because you've done the analysis and hopefully found all the technical issues, but you need to write the report, so you're going to have to go back th through all the logs, get all the dates, make sure your timelines match, because if you're in court, you're going to have to go by that timeline and make sure it all works. Figure out what went well, what went wrong. Identify the scope of your data loss. Now, if you've done this process right, hopefully you've limited the amount of data loss because you've contained the incident. 
Um, you'll need to update your incident response plan. It's a living document but based on what worked and what didn't work. Reassess your technologies, your policies, procedures. Uh, nobody's perfect. You can learn something from anything. Uh, I learned a lot of things from incidents I was involved with. And possibly prepare for court. And uh, that's a complete subject on its own. I wrote an article on it somewhere. So, uh, hey, we're doing good on time. I gave some resources here. These are historical, may be of some limited interest to you. Um, history of hacking and when I was looking at this and looking at the old focus of things it brought back lots of memories because um, a hack I was involved with back in 92 pre-commercial internet or just getting commercial Japanese site and Steve Bellman was a friend of mine I worked with him at Bell Labs and I called him and said hey I've got this uh, you know intruder on my system from the Netherlands and he goes oh you've got the hackers from Holland yeah there's this new organization CERT that's involved and you want to call the FBI so I went to my manager and told him this he goes no we don't want the FBI it's like really no Jap Japan does not want US government involvement so that was my first clue as oh we don't involve the FBI all the time so but these were some of the initial and early expectations for computer incident response and some of this is a little amusing because they talk about the threats and you find what they consider the big scary threats of the future were actually much worse than they thought. Um, these are some resources on data loss prevention and uh, what was it? Alt tab. I'm going to show you one of these because it's kind of cool. Uh, where are we? This site uh, and it's in the resources section it gives you, you can go to uh, one of these and it'll click up things about Arizona and what the notification laws are in that state. And I just thought this was kind of a cool, handy little thing to do. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. I'm doing this off the network, so uh, we just picked a few of these. You can go to there. Where's, you didn't grab Massachusetts? I think I did. Where's Massachusetts? There's New, There's New Jersey. What does my state do? So it's kind of handy. Nice little pictorial thing where you can go out and grab some of this stuff. So uh, I thought this was a pretty neat site. So uh, we've got Attrition's data loss site. And um, Etoliated is that graph I showed you before that's searchable. This is taking data loss. Oh, I should go back to Attrition's data loss. They have a mail list. So if you want to get informed of every data loss breach, you can get on their mail list. It's not really spam. I think, what, about five messages a day? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. And tells you about it. But you can also grab their database, which has all that. Or from a business point of view, Etoliated has an agreement with Attrition where they take the data loss database and come up with all those pretty graphs I showed you earlier which are really nice to have. This Ponymon annual study I'm taking with a huge grain of salt. The only reason I'm mentioning it is because I've seen a lot of articles written of the cost of a data loss is $197 per record. And I thought that would be a great way to take the data loss statistics and say, see, here's the numbers. Here's what all of these cost. And then when I came out with $1.8 billion for the TJ Maxx one, it's like, this doesn't sound right. So. The Ponymon study did about 35 sites and doesn't take a lot of things into account, but if you hear people refer to it and use that as a number, look at it and take it with a huge grain of salt. And that was a current RFC. So where am I now? Oh, these are some um, resources in incident response. NIST came out with that 147-page guide I mentioned. It really needs editing from my point of view. But the reason I didn't put a lot of resource links in the back of it is the end of the NIST uh, guide, they have law enforcement agencies, all the different teams that you can involve with security mailing lists. And you have to, well, there'll be a copy of this, so you'll have all of this. So um, there's a lot of good stuff at the end of that document. And you'll also see, if you look at the topics I did on incident response, that's really what it boils down to is those sections. So you can get lost in the trees if you look at that document. But the stuff at the end is really good, which is why I'm not repeating it. Center for Security has all those benchmarks I mentioned. And plug for my company that that's where Tenable lives. So in summary, this is your basic things. This is if you go through the NIST guide. Uh, one thing was I think SANS also has guides out there. And one of SANS things says that you need a jump bag with a, what was it, change of shirt and antacids. And I looked at that. I, 
was reviewing a report somebody wrote on that. I was like, who the hell cares? Your manager doesn't care what you smell like, and get this out of here. It doesn't belong. So um, I wonder if they've ever actually dealt with an incident. I have, and you don't have a lot of time. But it's preparation, and even though this here is one-seventh of what's on here, it's probably going to be 90% of what you're going to mm -hmm. have to do. It's going to also involve the most cost because it's not just doing incident response, it's putting your infrastructure in place that's going to support your incident response. And, you know, I had a client want me to write her an incident response policy and it's like, but you have no monitoring tools, you have no NAC devices, you've got no people involved for a team, so how can you support this policy? You know, we need to sh show we have a policy. But you can't support it, so what's the point? And <coughs> that kind of stuff drives me crazy. But preparation is also where you're going to get your biggest return on investment, because if you do it right, you can limit your losses by containing the incident and by identifying the extent of your data <coughs> loss. If you've had an incident, you have no idea, you've got nothing in place that's monitoring your system, you might have to assume that all your customer data records are gone, which is going to give you a nice big number on attrition. If you can positively identify because you've got a good security information management system, uh, only these systems and records were affected and I can prove this by these logs. That's going to limit your loss, it's going to limit your liability. So it, this is where you can show that we'll save money by implementing a security program. Um, detection, containment, evidence collection, uh, all of those happen very, very quickly. They should happen very, very quickly. You don't want to be downloading tools while you're in the middle of responding to an incident and figuring out how to use them. You need to have tools already in place, a staff that knows how to use them, that has practiced how to use them, practice how to mirror a disk, practice how to you know, scan your systems for vulnerabilities. I'm doing presently t testing with our new version of Nessus that came out this week, so I can do Nessus in my sleep. But for somebody new to it, might have some ramp up time. So you want to get familiar with the tools that you're going to use for that. Investigation, same thing. You need the tools for it, but you also need the background and you need the training. And that's part of your awareness program. Uh, eradication and recovery is a lot of patch management kind of things. And post-mortem, you need to have that organization in place. So, questions? I'm actually good on time. Questions or comments? I have a question. Sure. Um, vendor on a separate VLAN within your network, mm -hmm. you have to have some form of documentation letting them know that at any time you can scan that VLAN and create data and there's a breach. That, bring, that brings up a point that John made about a service level agreement with a third party vendor. And the point was if you've got a vendor on your network that has um, their own little sub network, do you have to tell them that you've got a the ability to scan their network. And that's why you have to have a third party agreement with them about scanning. Depending how you work that out, either they can scan their own network and show the, you the results. If they've got your data, I think you have a right to know how secure that data is. So that's get where you get into third party agreement and that's getting both business and technology people involved in it. Yes? I heard you mention uh, careful placement of Sniffers traffic analysis. Yes. I also heard you mention uh, uh, just now uh, having uh, agreements with folks uh, and then again contacting uh, your local for, for, uh, foreign law enforcement agencies that you deal with. Uh, one thing I didn't hear you uh, mention was uh, understanding uh, or, or having a geopolitical strategy for dealing with foreign governments, uh, understanding their, their privacy laws and their technology policies, and being able to manage a relationship where you may have intentionally or accidentally uh, log traffic that, that violates international law or that can cause a problem in a case that extends across the large geographic area. And I, I think that there, there are folks who are probably interested in knowing the procedures for, for building relationships with those folks. Uh, for instance, working with Germany. Yeah, um, the, the point is about uh, working with international organizations and people you have contacts with and knowing the laws in those different countries. Germany has its privacy laws. And if you're a U.S.-based company and you've got partnerships in other countries, you have to be aware of those laws in other countries. And when I did my five-day course for Sun, I covered that in detail, but I was trying to do 40 minutes here. But it is a really good, good point to make. 
and you should have an entire policy on sniffing and what is allowed and what's not allowed. Um, I think at one point one, there was a SANS paper that said if the FBI contacts you, you're now an agent of the FBI, and no, you're not. The FBI cannot direct you to set up sniffing um, systems. You can only sniff inside your network space that you own. Yes, unless Jim. You're a telco. They, they, they actually, yeah, unless you're, I was say, unless you're a telco, yeah. uh, or they, they'll just let themselves in and hook it up themselves. Yeah. Oh, uh, in, in addition to that, uh, uh, knowing knowing uh, the boundaries when uh, folks from foreign countries or entities enter your country and make use of your network resources, one of the more interesting things that I had exposure to during this instance this year was, uh, uh, again, we'll right on Germany just because they kind of invite them. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, uh, when, when our folks travel to your country, our laws extend uh, as they travel. Uh, to different locations. So if they commit a crime or if they uh, violate some user agreement or violate some uh, technology law in your country, we have the right to extend protection to that individual. And if you're monitoring that individual while they're in the confines of your country, uh, we'll have issue with action against them, which is, it brings up a lot of interesting questions. That's why I brushed over it really quickly, but as part of the C-13 computer incident response team, I said have legal involved and have the business units because the system administrator, it's not their job to know that. But they might say, yeah, I can throw the sniffer out there, but somebody else has to say, no, 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 there's laws against that and you can't put it here and you can't put it there. And that's why it has to be a cooperation between the business and the technology people because um, business people are supposed to know this stuff and keep on top of it. And you guys need to talk and make sure it all works. Well, the other thing that will help you is the acceptable use if you have in there that Using those resources are subject to monitoring and you agree with. It, it's taking some of the onus off of you because you've, not, you've done your due diligence in the notification so that you're not possibly violating wiretap laws either in the United States or some other country. Yeah, um, there's a point I was going to bring up and I can't remember what it was. I hate when that happens. Anybody have any other points? I know it's kind of hitting you with a lot of stuff in a very short amount of time. So, yes? Do you have handouts or? I don't have handouts. I was presuming that they're going to put these presentations online. They were really vague about that. OK, that's why I gave you my email okay. address. Uh, I should actually, can I add to this stuff? What do you want to do? Put another alternative email address uh, in case this one doesn't. Which email? Just a. Uh, to my Gmail address. Okay. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I check my private email address, the second one, more frequently than my work one because I have to go through so many things to get to my work one. That. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and you're product vendor and you've got things like my uh, work laptop, I wouldn't even connect to a network here because I just realized all my working directories have stuff that's not released yet, so I really don't want to use that here. So I hope I covered some things that you needed and thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. I'm so attached. Yeah, you're great. I was all of a sudden thinking of things like, oh shit, MD5 checksums. I didn't say MD5 checksums.